just just while we start on move on to the q and a session um we could really do with you guys sending a few more questions over to the using the q and a tab at the bottom please and uh we could do with definitely do with a few more for alice and claire please uh coming through um I'll just the question from me, I guess, to start, Alice, um, main opportunities for the UK industry, do you think? Where would your priorities be? Indeed. So, so really what we've got is we've got two opportunities here because we've already got the one that I was going to investigate for, which is a flower crop. Um, so we're importing a lot of the flowers and that doesn't make a huge amount of sense when this is a, a native plant that we can easily grow here. But also then you've got this new crop. So you've got elderberry. So we don't really eat and have elderberry products on our shelves at the moment. So I think there's a lot of scope for introducing that as a new crop. And what's really nice is you've got, you grow one plant and then you can take two crops off the same, the same field. So you can actually sort of take half the flower and half the berry. So yes, I think there's, there's opportunity that's already there waiting, but then there's, there's opportunity for product development too. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Richard from uh, William Waterfield. Uh, do you think our pros processes have the appetite for capital investment required to meet the capital expenditure required, as with most of them are focused on the domestic market? Yeah, well, this is the crux of the, the, the point that we're lacking investment and have been lacking investment in, in processing infrastructure to target um, export markets. We're dominated by, by um, high, high volume, low value liquid milk. And we're talking, we're talking serious, serious amounts of cash here to, to, to put the infrastructure in place to, to target these markets. But with uh, conventional dairy consumption in the UK and in fact across Western Europe in, in annual decline, we have to take a step back as farmers and, and say, where do we want to be in 25 years time? You know, I think um, decline in dairy consumption is around 1.8% per annum. It doesn't sound like much, but if you multiply that over 10 years, it's 18%. It's almost 20% reduction in, in, in domestic consumption. Meanwhile, our, our, our farmers are, are uh, pushing on and, and investing in their businesses and, and becoming more efficient. And, and so supply and demand are going the opposite direction. So where's, where's that extra demand going to come from? It's going gonna, it's gonna to have to come from, from um, other markets. Um, and it's about, I think, I think in the past, processors have maybe had fingers burnt and that, stump, that stifles confidence and in investment, maybe going too high up the value chain, investing, investing in infrastructure, the, the, the packaging, the, the, um, the packaging and the marketing um, to, to, to pitch too high up the value chain. Um, but we haven't had, we haven't seen a great deal of investment of investment in, in that sort of middle ground of, of higher value technical dairy ingredients. Thank you. Um, a question for Claire now from Avril. To what extent are sustainability and healthy eating being encouraged in new product innovations for potato production? Yeah, that's definitely at the core of most of the messages in every country I went to is looking at the nutritional benefit and what that can offer societies. So at the um, potato, Global Potato Conclave in India, they talked about the need for potatoes in the diet and what it offers a society or consumers. Um, they actually asked that there should be a subsidy for uh, farmers like there isn't for wheat to help uh, get to the market. So the nutritional value of potatoes is definitely being recognised in some of these markets. Um, there's already technology available to kind of take out a lot of the negatives and nutritional negatives in some of the processed goods, a lot that's in more um, European and American systems. Um, and then also in America, Potatoes USA are really focusing on the nutritional benefits. So they have a kind of sports package looking at potatoes being good for sports and providing the nutrition you need for um, taking part in sports and at professional level as well. So yeah, there's loads of wonderful uh, innovations and in trying to, um, a, the, the um, reputation of potatoes is definitely being looked after. Um, thanks, Claire. This is a question for, for all three. Um, so we'll, I guess we'll start with uh, with you, Claire, on this one. Um, it's from the South of England Agricultural Society. Um, 
to say to everybody about the importance of collaboration. How do we make this work in the UK, um, a, a country that is not great at this? Yeah, I think it's um, it's it's obviously critical. Supply chains can't work out without collaboration, and then, as I identified, that area of strategic collaboration and partnerships is where we need to be. It's finding those levels of trust, and I think that's what the industry has not been very good at, and, and realizing what well, it's not always the economics of what you're producing. We need shared. It's that um, moving forward as a, a collaborative. So I think we aren't good at it, but. The, turbulent times that we're going to go through we can't ignore it anymore and we're going to have to pull together and work as industries and um, sectors to get through yeah alice indeed yes i mean definitely what claire picked up and used the word trust and uh, i think what i learned from from traveling around the us and seeing what they've done there is is the fact that they do trust each other and so they've got to know each other personally processes grow as academics they know each other personally they've built relationships and that then leads to having trust. So it really goes back to the human level and getting all those simple human things right first. And then I think you can do some great business together. Um, and I think as well, we spoke um, last week with Vicky Robinson told us a lot about knowledge exchange and she talked about having lines. So there's there's areas where you can do a lot of sharing and then there's, there's, there's red lines where, you know, maybe you've got a recipe or something that's confidential and you keep that quiet. But there's a lot of, of the global issues that can actually be discussed together. So I think we need to stop being afraid of, uh, of, I think the word knowledge sharing is used a lot. And I wanted to use the word knowledge exchange because uh, to get over that idea that um, you give something and then you expect somebody to give you something back. So there's a, an exchange of knowledge. So you both grow together, not one person stealing somebody else's ideas. Because I think perhaps we've got a little bit um, uh, wrapped up in that in the UK um, in some industries. Yeah, Richard. Yeah, 100% collaboration has been something that has been seriously lacking in the, in the dairy sector um, for, for a number of years. The export led culture just hasn't been there. But I think times are changing pretty quickly. There's some pretty major global fundamentals hanging over us Brexit, economic fallouts left, right and centre, a result of coronavirus likely. And that that is looking like it's gonna it's gonna do something to galvanise the industry. Um, then the government certainly are, are um, pushing on with with the with the Department of International Trade and trying to trying to identify markets and, and do the work necessary at this end to, to supply those markets. The other the other the other point I would make is that co-ops. Uh, dairy co-ops in this country have got a significant role to play in, in galvanizing the industry and, and, and uh, collaborating with, with other, with other uh, key players in the industry. So that's something that we'll be, we'll be looking to push um, going, going forward. We saw an, an element of collaboration this summer when, when in the dairy industry when there was milk being ditched due to um, uh, lockdown and, and whatnot. Um, the industry sort of came together, a um, number of processors working together and, and voluntary milk reductions at farm level from farmers seemed to be, seemed to be successful. Um, you know, and that came about without any pre-planning, that just happened overnight because we had to. And, you know, when we get to desperate times, which, you know, we're not necessarily at yet, but the train is, is coming down the track um, from a milk supply and demand point of view. We need to be able to work together and to and to to find these markets and balance our, our national milk supply. Yeah, um, sticking with you, Richard, um, a question from Holly that you said you found an SLA project where farmers were hand milking uh, or milking in bales. I think was inspiring. Can you expand expand on what you found so inspiring by a system that is effectively, as you said, two generations behind, please? Yeah, really, it was about something completely different you know i've been to farms all over america all over europe and australia and new zealand and you know you, you see a lot of the same thing but these guys were were they were happy for a kickoff you know they were they were they were doing what they loved and and they weren't influenced by the outside world to any great degree interestingly we sat down and had a, a tea um some sort of green tea when we were finished our tour of the local collection center and we converted the milk price per litre uh, that they were receiving, and it was over 40 pence per litre. I know currency will have, a, will have an influence on that. But 
they're not necessarily low cost systems and they weren't making a fortune you know they were covering their costs and 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 a bit of subsistence living you know a bit left over for subsistence living they weren't making a fortune but you know the, the, the cost of production was um was was up there you know over 40 pence um the just the whole culture of 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 uh, of uh, east java round about malang it was a phenomenal place it was there were people everywhere the whole of indonesia is like that but um, a great great culture lovely people and it was just refreshing to see something different within the dairy industry uh, question um, in from Jim to both Claire and Alice. Uh, what can UK farmers learn from uh, regenerative practices that you both saw? Okay, well, I think an awful lot. Um, what surprised me and what interested me is that I saw a, a lot of systems that were neither claiming to be organic nor conventional. And so you, you've got somebody mixing the two systems together. And so what you can learn from, I think, from re regenerative practices is that um, lower inputs overall. So you can you can really use things around the farm. So this example of using ramiel wood chip around tree crops is just fantastic because most of the farmers were making their own wood chip from their hedgerows or growing softwoods like willows that are quick to grow. So, um, you know, they're creating their own, they're not buying in um, lots of herbicide or anything like that. They're just getting resources that they've already got on the farm and, and reutilizing them. So it's not just about saving the environment, but it's it's a lot more. You can you actually save some money here. Perfect. Um, Claire? Yeah, um, so I think our approach here is is really about controlling the environment. And, and when you when I went to see regenerative systems or more um, regenerative systems across there, it's about working alongside the environment. And that's the real change in how you can apply it. Um, there's loads of technology that we can use, but we're, we're still of that mindset of being we want to control rather than work with. So I think it's the way we apply the technology and it's all there that we can we can start to make those steps. But also it, it's it, it's not for everybody. And, and I think that's the important part. And when I've been working with the James Hutton Institute, it's definitely about these are for areas and specific producer systems, not about the whole system being under regenerative. It's doing what we can where we can. And again, back to that, that making more of the parts that we've got as opposed to trying to get bigger across more area. Thank you. A uh, question for Alice from Clive. Uh, what regulations are there for producing your own elderberry juice or elderberry? Uh, products and how would the first steps be in di diversifying into this as a business? Okay, so I think for us in, in the UK, we've got quite a lot of um, research work to do first because we, um, our native uh, plant is Nigra. So for Canadensis, the Americans have done a lot of work in the lab to show how the product can be safe. So elderberries, um, in particular Nigra, do contain some cyan cyanogenic glycosides like many food products do. And so you need to create processes which ensure that the product's safe. Um, and so what the Americans needed to do first was to um, do some work to actually prove that the levels uh, in the products were safe basically. So they, they've done some work on, on elderberry to show that basically um, there's less toxin in there than there would be from drinking a commercial apple juice. So we need to do that work on Nigra because I don't think um, that a lot of that data is readily accessible. The work will have been done in Central Europe, but it's not readily accessible to most UK farmers. So that work definitely needs to be done um, within the UK. Um, but uh, I think, interestingly enough, it's probably easiest to start with flowers as a crop um, because flowers don't have so many complicated uh, issues. And in particular with growing as well, I would say that with berry, you need to be uh, ready to, to manage your orchard to make sure you don't have pests and disease coming in. So in Central Europe, they have um, quite a challenge with SWD, so spotted wing dros drosophila at the moment. So you need to plan for that and make sure that you have a strategy um, to ensure that that doesn't attack your crop. Whereas flower, there are very few uh, pests out there that we know of at the moment that will come and attack it. So it might be easier to start with flower and then, and then start working on the research to get the elderberry juice uh, operation sorted out. And, and to follow up on that um, point, a question from Nick, um, Alice, would, would elder be a suitable companion crop in a cider apple orchard? And if so, what benefits would there be for each of the crops? 
I would say yes, because it, it, it seems to work very, very successfully in agroforestry uh, mixed systems. Um, in terms of mutual benefits, well, I think just having an orchard which has got di diverse uh, species in it is helpful in itself um, because uh, you're sort of stopping, if you've got a monoculture crop, then you, you, you're going to very quickly attract diseases and uh, pests to your field. Whereas if you break up the crop, um, then they're going to be slower to move in. Um, so I think it makes a more resilient orchard, for example, mixing them together. Um, I saw lots of examples, um, particularly in the US, where they're, they're interplanting uh, things like aronia um, with elderberry. Um, and uh, there are many pests that will prefer to attack the aronia before the elder, for example. Um, so I imagine that we could probably see some kind of benefit between apple and elder. Never actually tried it, but I think it would be a fantastic combination. Thank you. Um, back back to Richard. We haven't heard from him for a, a minute or two. Um, question from Jim Baird. Uh, what is it about the structure of the UK dairy industry that is preventing investment in value added export products and what needs to happen to change it? Um, the British dairy industry has never been as fragmented from a price point of view. Um, at the top end, you've got some premium contracts delivering a pretty, pretty healthy, profitable price. And in the bottom end, there's some pretty ropey um, liquid milk, middle ground liquid milk contracts out there and others. Um, so that's that's the, the problem with the structure. It's become too fragmented. As I said before, we've got a lack of export culture and export focus. Um, but we need to bring an element of competition to the market and to be able to control our own our own seasonal milk profile rather than relying on others and and uh, throwing throwing uh, commodity products about when, we, when we've got too much um what can be done as i said before co-ops have got a significant role to play in this um to, to galvanize farmers and to to push the industry forward and there will be going forward. There is going to be there is going to be significant uh, help, you know, uh, help in, with both structurally and with investment for uh, for for projects to target export markets. It's the way the country is going with everything that's hanging over us just now. Uh, question for you, Claire. Coming back to the regenerative question we had earlier, um, given the carbon release when the soil is bare and tilled, uh, how can potatoes be grown regeneratively in the UK? So I suppose there's a, di a few different approaches to that. If you look at more kind of commercial production, you want to make sure that it's through the whole farm system and through the, the, um, the rotation that you have in place as well. So it's not just looking at potatoes in complete isolation, but then there's also exciting stuff going on with like no-till potatoes. Um, so um, I've been challenged with this in the UK of, is it possible? And it, it seems like a really wild idea. Uh, and while I was in India, I met some uh, farmers who were actually doing it. So they were able to um, grow potatoes in a no-till system by using the rice paddy uh, straw to then have the potatoes in it. And, and that obviously isn't a way for growing potatoes for the, the domestic um, domestic market, but it is a way for being able to grow seed and generate and uh, multiply seed up. Um, and surprisingly, the skin finish on the um, the potatoes that it, it, in the rice paddy was exceptional. So there's, there's things that we're not considering, um, but it's because we're applying the same model that we've always worked with. Um question from um, this year's one of this year's scholars Dan Bidette so you can obviously tell he's done his presentation already when he's glibly asking questions of other people uh, given the pressure from retailers across the world to uh, reduce the price consumers pay is there room for greater margin for the primary producer start with whoever wants Claire obviously very keen to take this one on yeah, I think absolutely. There has to be. Um, like I, I, as I said there about strategic suppliers, every farmer who's producing a product must believe that the product they're producing is specialist to their customer. And that's a relationship we would have to build with the, the, um, the supply chain. And that's got to be all the way through to the, to the supermarkets. So absolutely. And we've got, to, we've got to consider the strategic position and move away from that commodity. Alice? Yeah, I would second that because everything that I saw about the success in the US was all about farmers getting in there quick, spotting a new crop 
and then going and doing the work themselves to tell the consumer how valuable it was so that you know the value is already there for them so um i think the message is it's, it's everybody getting involved in trying to make sure that you build that value and uh, not waiting for each other to do that for you because uh, i don't think a supermarket buyer is going to try and build that value for you you must do it yourself um so yeah a lot to learn from from other parts of the world for sure in in how they're doing that so uh, the example being elderberries as being a new crop for the uk well if we get in there fast then we can we can tell the consumer about what the benefits are because I, I think we our elder products people just see them as uh, really tasty things at the moment so people know elderflower quite well and they know it's something tasty they put in their gin and tonic um, but i think it doesn't go much further than that so there's a whole story around um having more diverse plants in your diet and therefore perhaps widening the nutrition that you're taking in overall across your diet. And it doesn't stop with elder. You can start thinking about some of the other wild natives that we have as well. Um, but message is get in there quickly and, and build the value yourself. Yeah, I mean, it boils down to the fact that everybody's in business to make money right through from the farmers to, to, to retailers, no matter where you are in the world. But in the dairy in the dairy sector, I set out in my Nuffield thinking that um, the way to go would be to to create some lovely British or Scottish brand and, and target international export markets, and it would all be rosy. But I soon learned, especially from from um, some some farmers in New Zealand that I got chatting to in China over the course of a week that. There's some serious complexities in, in, in targeting international markets. And one of the biggest one is, is cultural differences. And you need to have the partners in these markets to be able to, to, to be able to understand that culture and keep your product relevant in these markets. It boils down to the fact that if you've got a, a ton of whole milk powder at say two and a half thousand quid a ton, you add value to it. It sounds good, you know, you add value to any commodity. It sounds good, but you inherently you inherently incur cost. And if your cost goes up greater than your value, you'd have been as well flogging that ton of milk powder at the two and a half thousand uh, quid a ton. So adding value sounds great, but it's tough. And, and it's been the downfall, the, the pinch point for a number of global co-ops in particular, but, but companies as well. There's, there's thousands of branded products fail that nobody ever hears about. Thousands of product innovations fail. I, I had a meeting with um, with Fonterra's product innovation team in Beijing, and they told me. I said, "You know, how do you quantify? How do you quantify the success of a product innovation?" And they said, "Every product innovation is a success because it's a learning opportunity." But it didn't really answer the the, the business side of it, the the, the 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 value. You know, where that value's gone because you get into a serious amount of cash. The cash required to develop a product, to manufacture the product, to develop the packaging, to keep it relevant in the consumer marketplace with marketing and branding and, and, and promotions at retail level. The cost involved in that is phenomenal. And, and it's only a certain proportion of the market that can, that can withstand that. So yeah, back, back to the question, how do we add value for the primary producer? It's tough. There are ways, but sometimes if you pitch yourself at the right stage in the value chain, you're better off than going to either end. Just um, Matthew Curry's question here is, um, well, Richard and Alice have been exactly on from there. Is, is there an opportunity for further regional um, points of difference in the export market? So, you know, Richard, do you want to, that sort of leads in nicely from the last question, really. Yeah, there definitely is. I mean, Creating a, a British brand or a Scottish a Scottish brand would carry in 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 the world market, and and one thing that I've learned is creating a brand within the food industry is 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 as strong a point as as creating a consumer facing brand, and as a, as a lady in in New Zealand that I met said to me, Scottish Scottish product would sell anywhere in the world because you're you're, you're just viewed as England's poor little little cousin, so. There is there is opportunity to develop to develop national brands or regional regional brands for for specific products and in in, in my studies in my studies case um, that would be in a, a brand within the food manufacturing industry. Fonterra's very successful ingredients and co-op brand is known as NZMP, and I never knew that before. And I guess that that. that uh, most of the rest in the dairy industry wouldn't have realised. And I went out to Dubai um, to, to a 
to a food industry event called Golf Food, absolutely colossal. And there was a whole hall the size of a football field full of dairy, international dairy traders. And uh, it was all targeted at the food manufacturing industry. Um, and the, 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 the brands within the industry that nobody realizes nobody realizes are phenomenal. New Zealand are good at it, Ireland are good at it, and Holland are very good at it. But uh, the UK, not so much. Alice? Yeah, so I'd side that. It's about creating a brand, but it's about the story as well, isn't it? So yeah, I think there is opportunity for regional produce as well. Um, going, yeah, going back to the story and basically uh, being able to have some clear messages that you're going to tell your consumer. So again, if you look to what they're doing in the US, they've got these sort of three things. They've got this farmer grown, farmer owned, they've got a sustainable supply and they've got this native elder mantra. And so it's very clear messages, very easy to understand for the consumer. Um, and they're kind of solid USPs as well, aren't they? So, um, you know, the one thing that, that that's difficult is Wild Collected is, is a wonderful sounding uh, story to the consumer on the face of it. But when you dig into it a little bit more, um, it's perhaps not so easy to increase volumes and, and scale of businesses based on, on that wild picked USP. Whereas um, when, you, when you're in control of what you're growing, um, then you can build your story around. We grow these in Britain and you can plan to grow the right amount that you need for the uh, the business plan that you have for your for your producer, uh, which is why you've got to have the grower and the and the and the processor working very closely together because you need to make those plans together. And of course, the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. And so uh, planting trees, it, it does take a few years for elder to yield, although they are quite fast. Um, so that, that planning needs to happen early on. But yes, I can see how we can build uh, at least a story for British products with British grown ingredients in them. Um, because that only bolsters what the story that we've already got, because we're already shipping these elderflower products around the world um, and saying how wonderful they are. And we've, we've drunk these for centuries in Britain, come and try this. Um, but to be able to say that we've also grown the flowers as well in our beautiful countryside, um, I think it's an easy sell as a story. Thank you. Um, question uh, to all three again from James Black. Um, the opportunity to feed back, I guess, in your traditional way from your Nuffield journey has clearly been impacted by COVID. Uh, how are each of you going to make up for this by seeking other ways to engage and deliver your messages to your relevant industries? Who wants to take this first one? I can, if you like. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it, obviously it would be really nice to go and meet each other and go and start seeing people. Um, so hopefully that will happen soon in 2021 and we can actually, uh, you know, start having those kind of interactions that are so important. Um, but currently um, we have got a small group of us in the UK now already talking to each other. Um, interestingly, I'm sort of seem to be a kind of a central point for this. And so hopefully this Nuffield Scholarship, I'm hoping will make a central point where we can, we can start connecting a little bit further. Um, and, and yeah, basically um, I would like people to contact me. So uh, it's helpful to be able to do this presentation today to, to get people in, in touch and to get people talking. And I'm happy to be that facilitator in the middle. Richard? Yeah, um, undoubtedly COVID has, has uh, stifled, stifled a number of things, including our ability to deliver our findings to the wider Nuffield community and the agricultural community. I was lucky in that I did most of my travels in the early part of this year, January, February and March, and I was cut uh, short by about a week in New Zealand. I um, had to come home because the place was locking down. Um, but, but I did manage to do 20 flights and, and have managed to do 20 flights in 2020, which, is, uh, which isn't easy done in the year that this has been. But I'm, I'm, I'm still um, in, in regular contact with another, a number of stakeholders in the country. Um, this can't, you know, the challenge that we've got in front of us can't be, can't be overcome by any individual. And it's about bringing people together and um, engaging. I'm in, in contact with a, 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 a um, dairy, dairy development strategy here in this country, um, in contact with uh, dairy traders over in continental Europe and uh, um, a food tech venture uh, based in London. So yeah, things things will happen. Claire? Yeah, I suppose um, 
like COVID has highlighted that we just can't stand still as an industry. Like it's impossible to do that, to remain kind of current. So um, yeah, I think people are still hungry for information and, and still looking for answers and how to survive and become more resilient. So um, I'm definitely still working with growers and doing presentations, talking to people. And actually, the, and I said on the 24th of November, we'll get together as a whole industry. Um, and the, the, the benefit of being virtual is that hopefully there's people internationally on today but we can bring together people from all over the place and it's allowing me to bring someone from Colorado to actually talk about regenerative systems in Colorado uh, on the 24th so although it's frustrating that we can't get together in person the opportunities that sometimes the digital platform provides is really exciting so I hope not to miss any of the messages and the connections that I'll get out of my Nuffield and I'll continue to do that whichever way possible. Um, as we coming towards the close of this session um just a question question from campbell tweed really to each of you just a few points guys in where you think your own sectors will look like in in five years time which i think is a nice a nice point to finish on really um alice can you uh start us off please yep i can indeed in five years time so in five years time uh, if we were to plant some elders now, we would be taking a really nice crop from them. Um, so there are a number of farms that have already established and I am already working with them um, and they are already picking a crop. So we've seen quite a nice crop of British grown elderflowers actually already this year. Um, and yeah, five years time, there should be plenty of them. Uh, I think that it doesn't all happen overnight. So I think it's important to say we don't just try and imp um, replace all of the imports straight away overnight with with British grown stuff because that's not realistic and it doesn't allow you to keep your options open. So I think it's a gradual process, but um, yeah, I hope to be seeing a lot more fields of elder in five years time as I, as I drive around the countryside. Thank you. Uh, Richard? Yeah, so attracting inward investment for infrastructure projects to, to process milk and take, take um, charge of our, our own destiny and control our own seasonal profile of milk is, is what we're needing and if we can get that investment then getting the product to market is not the, not not the issue here um developing a brand as we've talked about within the food industry and getting that product to developing markets in turn that would bring a, a significant element of competition into the uk market for for milk and for dairy products and allow both farmers and processors to to have that leverage and be able to 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 um to have other outlets and other options for milk and ultimately it's about allowing farm businesses or, 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 or facilitating farm businesses to be able to grow and develop and that trickle down effect into the wider rural economy would be significant it's not just it doesn't just stop at farm level it's about everybody that we employ all the, supp the supply and the support services that uh, that rely on the primary producer the, the farmer or particularly the dairy farmer um, as as the subsidy land, landscapes change and as arable arable farmers look to inc incorporate more organic matter into soils then there, there seems to be a bit of an appetite for for a uh, more dairy investment in some of these other sectors so that's only going to contribute to the supply of milk in the country and uh, we need the processing capacity to deal with it we've got the supply the market's there it's about joining the dots perfect and Claire to finish. Okay, so I think in reality, in five years' time, there will be less growers. Um, we will be able to adopt uh, new breeding programs, so we'll be able to speed up some of the progress that we see in the potato supply chain. Um, I think the focus needs to be on niche and not complex. So understanding how we can use some of that technology and innovation to make sure we, we focus on that niche product, not making it more and more complex. Um, a focus needs to be on the domestic market, and we mustn't forget about that. And then I think the potential for exports and being connected to um, a, a growing export markets in developing countries is, is huge for what uh, Scotland especially can offer with seed potatoes. Well, uh, thanks guys. I think we've had a, a great session uh, the early part this afternoon. Um, for me, it's really nice in the presentations to get back to Nuffield Basics and see a lot of pictures and story, hear stories about the guys that you met. Uh, people you met in the various countries and that's you know for me sort of 15 years on from my nuff field still remember a lot of people from from back then um 
we've obviously entered lockdown now, so we've got loads of opportunity for all the people watching in on this to uh, read up on your reports and watch another couple of great sessions to come um, as part of this virtual conference this year. I'd just like to thank everybody who's contributed, all the uh, questions that have been posed and a bit of chat there as well and everybody that's listened in. So uh, thank you very much, everybody.